Yes, Dr. Rashmi. My patient, Mrs. R, residing in Huskote, housewife by occupation, studied up to primary schooling. She belongs to lower middle socioeconomic status by modified BG Prasad classification. She is a third gravida, para 2 living 2 and came with 9 months of amenorrhea. She was admitted on 11th of March at 9 am. She came with complaints of labor pain since last 2 hours and leaking per vagina since half an hour. Uh, here I would like the students to note that whenever you are presenting your chief complaints with things like since 2 hours or since half an hour, so it is important that you also mention the date and time of admission. Otherwise, that becomes irrelevant. Going ahead with history of presenting illness, she is a third gravida, para 2, living 2, with 9 months of amenorrhea. She was a booked case at local PHC, where she was referred today in view of high risk pregnancy, that is, post caesarean pregnancy. Labor pains since 2 hours and intermittent onset, progressive in nature, intensity, and radiating from back. This was the type of pain she had and history of leaking per vagina since last half an hour, perceiving adequate fetal movements. So, what are the other characteristics of true labor pains? To say it as a true labor pains, it should be insidious in onset and it should be progressive in nature and the pain should be increasing in intensity, duration and frequency. The intensity, duration and frequency of the pain is progressive and increasing in nature and the pain is not continuous, it should be intermittent type of pain and it is not relieved by any medications or rest. It is usually associated with cervical changes to say it as a true labor pains. Good and whenever you mention the leaking per vaginum, you must also mention the color of the liker if the patient has noticed that color. There was no history of burning micturition or increased frequency of micturition. Uh, when we talk about the negative history, if you give us the relevance of asking that negative history, that always adds to the presentation. No history of burning micturition or increased frequency of micturition was asked to rule out urinary tract infections causing pain abdomen. No history of swelling in the legs, headache, blurring of vision or epigastric pain and vomiting are asked to rule out hypertensive disorders and associated abruption causing pain abdomen. No history of fever and vomiting, acute GI causing a pain abdomen and no history of trauma of bleeding per vagina was asked if these reasons were the cause for pain abdomen. Coming to the present pregnancy, she conceived spontaneously two years after her second pregnancy, had regular antenatal checkups in a government hospital, a PHC. First trimester, no history of excessive nausea, vomiting, and no history of pain abdomen or bleeding PV, and folic acid prophylaxis was taken. No history of radiation exposure, drug intake, and her dating scan was not done. So, what is the significance of her conceiving two years after her previous pregnancy? In my patient, she is a case of post caesarean pregnancy. If we have to try for a trial of vaginal birth after caesarean, that is TOLAC, then they should be having gap of minimum 18 months for trying. So, if the gap is more than 18 months, then chances of su successful vaginal birth after caesarean are higher compared to a lady who has had less than 18 months of interval between the two pregnancies. Though it is not a contraindication, but the chances of success are lesser if the interval is less. And also to replenish her iron stores, a minimum of 2 to 3 years gap are required to restore her lost stores. Coming to the second trimester, quickening was felt at 5th month and her iron and calcium supplements were taken and 2 doses of tetanus toxoid was taken, anomaly scan was done and said to have no obvious anomalies. In third trimester, no history of leaking or bleeding per vagina and she had no history of pedal edema. She perceived fetal movements well and she came today with the present complaints.
Coming to her obstetric history, the previous pregnancies, her first pregnancy was in the year 2017, her antenatal period was uneventful, in intranatally she underwent a caesarean section which was termed caesarean electively done in view of breech presentation. It was a female baby, 3 kgs birth weight and postnatally the, it was uneventful and she breastfed the baby for 6 months. So how significant? is this elective caesarean for breech presentation as an indication for her previous caesarean. Breech presentation being a non-recurrent indication for caesarean section, she need not have at present caesarean section if it is a cephalic presentation. Some of the non-recurrent causes or indications for caesarean sections are like breech presentation, fetal distress, meconium stain lichen, non-progression of labor, these are the non-recurrent indications for caesarean section. The recurrent indication would be a major degree cephalopelvic disproportion or a contracted pelvis. Her second pregnancy was in the year 2019, antenatally it was uneventful, it was a intranatally term vaginal delivery, we back in a hospital at delivered a female child weighing 2.5 kgs at birth. Postnatally, she was uneventful and breastfed for 8 months for the baby. So, I would like the students to notice that this lady has had a vaginal delivery after caesarean already. There are a few mnemonics which are used for in relation to post caesarean pregnancy. One is TOLAC, trial of labor after caesarean. We use this term when we are planning for a vaginal delivery in a post caesarean pregnancy and if this trial is successful then it is called VBAC or vaginal birth after caesarean. So in this case she has had a vaginal birth after her previous caesarean delivery. This is her third pregnancy in the year 2021 and present pregnancy as described her first, second and third trimester. Her menstrual history, she attained menarche at 13 years and 4 to 5 days cycle for every 30 days, regular, normal flow, no clots and no dysmenorrhea. Her last menstrual period was on 15th June 2021 and by Negley's formula, her expected date of delivery will be on 22nd March 2022. Past history, she was not a known case of hypertension, diabetes, epilepsy, tuberculosis, asthma, heart disease or known case of thyroid abnormalities. No history of blood transfusion in the past. Surgical history, she had no major minor surgeries except for a pre previous caesarean section. Coming to her family history, there was no history of multiple pregnancy or congenital anomalies in the family. Her personal history, diet was mixed, appetite was good. Adequate sleep, bubble and bladders were regular and had no habits. So this is where we would like you to summarize the history findings for this case. So to summarize in the history, my patient Mrs. R, 28 years of age, she is a third gravida para 2 living to with 9 months of amenorrhea, came with labor pains for last 2 hours and leaking per vagina since half an hour. No history suggesting of hypertension, abruptio or infections in her. Her obstetric history is that she is a case of post caesarean pregnancy, one previous LSES and also she has one previous vaginal birth after caesarean. So she is a one previous LSES and one V back and no significant past family or personal history. So we will now move ahead with the examination. Coming to the general physical examination, my patient is conscious, coherent, moderately built and nourished. Her pulse was 92 beats per minute, regular and normal volume. Her blood pressure was 110 by 70 millimeters of mercury in the right arm sitting posture. No pallor, ictris, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or pedal edema was noted. Her spine, breast and thyroid was normal. Coming to her systemic examination, her cardiovascular system and respiratory system was normal and no abnormalities were detected. Coming to the obstetric or the per abdomen examination, on inspection, the uterus was uniformly enlarged by gravid uterus confirmed by linea nigra and striae gravidarum. There was a suprapubic transverse scar present measuring about 15 cm in length and healed by primary intention. 
her flanks were full and umbilicus was flat. In a case of post cesarean pregnancy, you will find a scar on the abdomen. So that scar needs to be described in detail. Like it is a transverse scar present in the suprapubic region measuring up around 12, 15 centimeters. It will be around 12 to 15 centimeters in length. And how is the healing, whether it's by primary intention or secondary intention. If it is healed cleanly, it is a primary intention and it has a raggy edges, then it is secondary intention. Okay, that is how it is healed. And also you can look for scar herniation or incisional hernia. On palpation, her symphysiofundal height was corresponding to term gestation and Symphysiofundal height measured around 36 centimeters. The abdominal girth was 94 centimeters. Fundal grip was broad, soft, irregular mass suggestive of breach. And lateral grip was left in the left lateral grip. It was smooth, uniform, curved resistance suggestive of fetal back. And right side there was an irregular knob like structures suggestive of fetal limbs. In the first pelvic grip, it was a hard globular mass suggestive of fetal head which was not belotable because of engagement. In the second pelvic grip, the hands were diverging because the head is engaged and uterus had a contractions of three contraction lasting 35 to 40 seconds in every 10 minutes. The scar was non-tender and there was no scar tenderness. And by Johnson's formula, her estimated fetal weight came to 3,870 grams. How did you elicit the scar tenderness in this patient? Scar tenderness should be elicited in the relaxation period of time, not at the contraction. When the uterus is relaxed at that time, just above the pubic symphysis, not over the scar, but just above the pubic symphysis, using the pulp of the finger, we indent the finger downwards and backward direction where the previous uterine scar was there. While doing so, you should distract the patient by talking to her and you will palpate the scar length all through the lower segment and then you will see for tenderness. If there is tenderness even during the relaxation of the uterus, then it suggests of scar tenderness. So this has been demonstrated in the obstetric examination of the pregnant lady in one of our other videos. Coming to auscultation, fetal heart sounds was heard in the left spino umbilical line regular and at 142 beats per minute. Now the abdominal inspection, palpation and auscultation over, then we'll go ahead with internal examination, which was cervix was 4 cm dilated, 50% effaced, soft central, membranes were absent and vertex was zero station. Pelvis was adequate. As an undergraduate student, you're not expected to do a vaginal examination. These findings will be given to you along with the patient details. Coming to the examination summary, it was a single live intrauterine fetus with longitudinal lie, cephalic presentation, head was engaged in active labor with previous LSES and no scar tenderness. After such a long presentation, we need to have a summary of the case before we give come to the provisional diagnosis. Coming to the summary, a 28 year young lady booked case third gravida with para 2 living 2 with 9 months of amenorrhea with previous 1 caesarean section and 1 vaginal birth after caesarean in labor since last 2 hours. On examination, she was corresponding to term size with flanks full and single live intrauterine fetus with cephalic presentation, longitudinal lie in active labor with previous LSES and no scar tenderness. So the diagnosis would be Gravida 3, Para 2, Living 2 with single live intrauterine gestation of 38 weeks 5 days with longitudinal lie, cephalic presentation in active labor with previous 1 caesarean and 1 vaginal birth for institutional delivery. So this is how you would present a post caesarean case. The discussion can go in various directions. So let us start with the common questions which are asked. So what are you planning for this particular patient? So before going ahead with the management, I would like to do a routine investigations for the mother and the fetus. 
the routine investigations for the mother being complete blood count, blood grouping and also serology for HIV, HBSAG, VDRL and for the fetus as an admission test I would like to do a cardiotocograph or a CTG to know the contraction related decelerations if there are any. Then we have to also reserve at least one unit of blood for this patient in labor. Now coming to the basics of post cesarean pregnancy, how do you define a cesarean delivery? Caesarean section is defined as an operative procedure to deliver the fetus after the period of viability by giving an incision on the abdomen and the intact uterus. Yes, so this excludes delivery of the fetus in case there is uterine rupture which has already happened. Right, let us come to the common indications for caesarean delivery. There are very many indications for caesarean section. In the same way, they are classified also many ways. For example, absolute indications, relative indications, also recurrent indications, non-recurrent indications. But let me tell you about the Danforth classification, which is easy to remember and you will not miss on any indications. The first category is where delivery indicated, but labor is contraindicated. For example, in cases like previous two or more caesarean sections, in upper segment caesarean or classical caesarean section or cephalopelvic disproportion is there where labor is contraindicated. In such cases, it comes to category 1. Category 2 is delivery is indicated, but labor is not inducible. That means all the medical disorders like uh, where you cannot induce labor comes to this category. And thirdly, fetal distress. It is an absolute indication for caesarean if the fetal distress is in first stage of labor. Coming to the fourth category where it is an emergencies, emergency caesarean like cord prolapse, abruptio placente, these are emergency indications for caesarean section. And, and lastly coming to final category where caesarean delivery on maternal request that is CDMR. So if we are planning a trial of labor for this patient, how should we go about counselling this patient? So to counsel this patient, we should always lean towards vaginal delivery more than a repeat caesarean. So we should explain the benefits of vaginal delivery to her more. For example, if she has a vaginal delivery, then less hospitalization, cost effective, pain is less, mobility is faster and also less requirement of blood and blood products. If she has a successful vaginal delivery, then she has less chance of developing complications. Whereas if she goes for a repeat caesarean section, then there is more chance of requirement of blood, pain is more and also mobility is restricted, hospitalization is more, it is costlier also. Whenever we are counselling a patient for post caesarean section, we should always counsel by keeping in mind that we should encourage her to have a trial of labour and successful vaginal birth after caesarean. So you should tell the advantages of vaginal birth, for example like less cost, faster mobility and less hospitalisation pain is less, requirement of blood and blood products are less and if she has a successful VBAC then chances of complications are very less. But if you are explaining about the caesarean, you should also explain about the difficulty that you encounter to do repeat caesarean section and also pain, cost, everything is high in a case of repeat caesarean section. But you should always keep in mind, you should explain her the rarest complications also like scar dehiscence, fetal distress, uterine rupture also should be explained to the patient. So you must impress upon the patient that as her labour progresses, we will continue to monitor her labour. And at the slightest indication of some problem or that labour not going as, as per our requirement, in such cases, we will take her up for emergency caesarean delivery. So let's see, in case we plan to take her up for trial of labour, what are the prerequisites which must be met before we do a trial of labour? 
to allow for a trial of labor after cesarean section that is tolac it should always happen in an institute where there is a facility of obstetrician neonatologist and anesthetist available 24 by 7 and also there should be a blood bank on availability of blood and blood products as and when required before going for all these things the consent of the patient is mandatory for allowing her for trial of labor after cesarean section also we should examine the patient and she should be having cephalic presentation and she should not be having a classical or a upper segment cesarean section or more than two cesarean section and there should be no cephalo pelvic disproportion in the present baby once you have decided to allow this patient for trial of labor how will you conduct the labor for this patient so monitoring her as she is a high risk pregnancy we should always use a partograph to monitor her and also most importantly we should monitor her pulse rate which is the first sign of scar dehiscence and also we should monitor the fetal heart rate using a electronic fetal monitoring like cardio tocograph and we should monitor the fetal heart rate and the pulse of the mother all through the pregnancy at least every half an hourly in case there is any abnormality detected in the fetal heart rate and you have to take her up for cesarean delivery so what are the problems that you are likely to encounter in this repeat cesarean delivery so since she is a post cesarean pregnancy entering in the abdomen would only be difficult for example she might have a skin keloid or the rectus sheet might be fibrosed peritoneum might be adherent the abdominal uh, structures might be adherent to the uterine tissue or also there might be advancing of the bladder or the bowel might be stuck to the previous scar so entering into the abdomen only would be very much difficult in the initial part and also once we enter the abdomen and the uterus the extraction of the baby might be difficult because of the fibrosis and there is more chance of injury to the adjacent structures like bladder and the bowel and the ureter in case of severe adhesion or a plastered abdomen so dr roshni has just mentioned some of the complications related to repeat cesarean delivery can you elaborate on some more of them Yes sir in third stage of labor after the extraction of the baby there can be more complications associated with the patient for example like delivery of the placenta might be difficult like the delivery may be difficult due to adherent placenta which is more common after a previous cesarean as the number of cesarean increases the chances of adherent placenta also increases the extraction of the placenta might be difficult firstly secondly the after the extraction of the placenta they can have postpartum hemorrhage the because of difficulty in contraction due to adhesions and also if the placenta is not able to remove then we may have to do even cesarean hysterectomy so now let us come to the postnatal period how do we manage such a case immediate post operative once the delivery is done by cesarean section the post operative instructions for this patient include firstly keep her nil pour orally at least for 4 hours and give her enough hydration by iv fluids at least 2500 ml over 24 hours give her good amount of analgesia antibiotics can be given as per hospital policy and also we should monitor her pulse bp urine output including the input of input output chart should be maintained and you should check for the abdomen for uterine contraction and also we should check for per vaginal bleeding if there is any postpartum hemorrhage good so now let us see if this patient was not for vaginal delivery and you have to plan for a repeat cesarean delivery so what would be your pre operative instructions in case a patient is planned for elective cesarean delivery If we have planned for elective cesarean section for a patient we should ask her to come with fasting of 7 to 8 hours that is prior to the operation they should have a fasting period of 7 to 8 hours and once she is come for admission you should take a consent for cesarean section and we should arrange blood and blood products as per requirement and also we should give a pre op medications like injection rantac perinom and prophylactic antibiotic one hour prior to the incision can you enlighten us about the different types of incisions used for cesarean delivery 
Coming to the different types of incisions, it can be on the abdominal wall or the uterine wall. Firstly, the abdominal wall incision. The most commonly done incision is fan and steel incision, which is 2 centimeters above the pubic symphysis and it is a curvy linear incision. It is curved at the edges and it is around 12 to 15 centimeters in length. The other incision is Joel Cohen incision, which is transverse straight incision, which is from 3 centimeters above the pubic symphysis. It is a straight incision. It also measures 12 to 15 centimeters in length. Previously, they used to give a midline incision, subumbilical midline vertical incision, but no more followed. Coming to the uterine incisions, uterine incision is most commonly given as lower segment transverse incision. This is curse incision. The other one is lower segment vertical incision. The lower segment transverse, also called LSCS, was given by Munroker, hence it is called curse incision. But this is called as Keherer incision, lower segment vertical incision. Rarely, we can also give a classical incision, that is upper segment vertical incision. Now that you mentioned classical cesarean, what could be the indications for classical cesarean delivery? As already told, classical or the vertical incision on the uterine wall is rarely given. That is only when the lower segment accessibility is not there. For example, in cases of CA cervix or fibroid or severe dense adhesion in the lower segment where you cannot access the lower segment. And also when we are doing perimortem hysterotomy, that time also we can give a upper segment incision. So this brings us to the close of discussion regarding post cesarean deliveries. Trial of labor after cesarean is a viable option because 60 to 80 percent of them result in vaginal birth after cesarean. So I hope we have been able to answer your queries regarding post cesarean delivery. Thank you very much. Thank you.